Thank you very much. My assignment this morning is a virtually impossible task. I have 50 minutes to summarize 15 years of research and half a dozen books. What I propose to do is outline the story of our construction of the Soviet Union. I will start the outline in 1917 and bring you down to the present day chronologically. But this outline is a framework, it's a mere skeleton of the whole story. But what I will do is draw your attention to the nature of the published evidence, and I hope you will excuse me if I rely mostly on my own books, because that's the evidence I know best. This, of course, is in the true nature of a seminar. It's my job to point the way. And it's yours, if you wish, to pick up the threads and assemble the facts into a mosaic. From time to time this morning, I will refer to unpublished evidence and research yet to be undertaken. We do not yet have the full story. In other words, I will point out the gaps. This is important because if you push the argument beyond the limits of the evidence at hand, the inevitable result is a loss of credibility. Now, the best way to introduce my topic is to make a point about information in a socialist society. This is a sophisticated audience. You know about distortion and suppression and elimination of the facts. We live in a socialist society, and suppression of information is typical of such societies. To eliminate freedom, one must first eliminate widespread knowledge of the truth. So I submit to you that today in the United States there are three levels of information. The first level we could call the establishment version. It's what most people have believed in the past to be true about events and history. The difference today compared with, say, a decade ago is that the credibility of the establishment has been shattered. People in general no longer believe in Washington or anything that comes out of Washington. So this first level is what the government or the establishment wants you to know. Only coincidentally is it the truth. The criteria they use are two, I suggest. One, they say, what do we want them to know? And secondly, they say, is it consistent with what we told them last time? And sometimes they slip up and then the statements become inoperable. Then we have the second level of information, sometimes called the revisionist level. It challenges the first level, but it's still based on documents and information released by the bureaucrats and politicians in Washington. It does not get to the root of the problem. It doesn't get to the root of the problem because it relies mainly on facts which they decide can be released. I would suggest, and I hope you won't take this unduly critically, that the critics of the Kennedy assassination probably fall within this category. There's no question they're onto something. But they're still at the second level because they rely on information which it has been decided can be released. They will not get to the third level until they get all the information within government files, and that, I understand, may take 75 or 100 years. Then we get to the third level, and I suggest that presumably almost everybody or everybody in this room is operating or wants to operate on the third level. It is based on new documentary evidence that has to be rooted out from the research viewpoint. You have to know where to look. You have to know about its existence. You have to demand it. You have to get it declassified. You must accept when you're in my position that when you initially publish it, most people will not believe you. They will not believe you because the establishment version got in there first and the mess of the media, and I'm not blaming the media for this, got behind it and publicized what they believe to be the truth. But we're now getting a number of very solid, substantial books written on this third level. I'll give you some quick examples. Uh, Colin Simpson, the Lusitania, an attempt to bring the United States into World War I, documented. Julius Epstein, Operation Keelhole, 
A very new book by Guy Richards, uh, The Rescue of the Romanovs. The Tsar was not murdered, as the establishment would like you to believe. From the liberal side of things, uh, I would suggest Jules Archer, the plot to seize the White House. So, I emphasize this morning that my outline is going to be at the third level. It's based on authentic and original documentation, mostly from government files. It is directly and verifiable evidence. I always make the citations and the references. Up to a few weeks ago, I could always say that the facts have never been openly challenged. Uh, there was a recent exception in London, uh, because I'm getting somewhat more publicity in Europe than I am here. The Soviet Weekly decided to counter uh, some of my arguments. It was probably forced to do so. Unfortunately, they picked the wrong example. They said I was wrong about the, uh, the Soviet Marine, uh, Merchant Marine, and the origin of its diesel engines. They said my figures and facts were wild. Uh, unfortunately for Soviet Weekly, this is one case where all my evidence came from Russian sources. So I pointed out to the Soviet Weekly, it's quite obvious that the Soviet right hand doesn't know what the Soviet left hand is doing. So let's get to the point. So let's get to the point. How did the Soviet Union become a world power? Let's go back to the revolutions. The two revolutions in 1917. The first revolution in March of 1917 overthrew the Tsar and replaced the Tsar with a, what could, would well have been a constitutional government. It was, these were the first shaky steps taken in March 1917 towards a constitutional government in Russia. This constitutional government was overthrown by the Bolsheviks in November of 1917. There is major evidence, which I have published, of U.S. involvement. Not on the side of the formation of a constitutional government, but on the side of the Bolsheviks. Not the March Revolution, but the November Revolution. Now, I've not got the whole story. I've published what I have been able to unearth. And these are roughly the key points. In March 1917, at the time of the uh, First Revolution, Lenin was in Switzerland and Trotsky was in New York. They were the two major operators in the Bolshevik Revolution. Lenin returned to, uh, to Russia with the aid of the German High Command. I reasonably suspect that the Kaiser did not know. The highest German official who knew about this was Chancellor Bethmann Holweg from the well-known, perhaps in Germany, the Bethmann Holweg um, uh, banking family. Trotsky was in New York, a penniless immigrant apparently. He acquired $10,000 in gold. He acquired an American passport. He was put on a boat for Russia. The Canadian authorities pulled the boat into Halifax, Nova Scotia. They took off Trotsky and his party, locked them up as prisoners of war. There was immediate intervention from both London and Washington, and the, the, this doc these documents are in the files. He was put back on the boat for Russia with apologies. Also on the boat were Lincoln Steffens, quite a well-known leftist in the United States, and Charles Crane of the Westinghouse Company, and Charles Crane was chairman of the Democratic Finance Committee at that time and a friend of Woodrow Wilson. And the book tells you what happened and how they met and talked on the boat. Also, in July 1917, a Colonel William Boyce Thompson, who was the first permanent director of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, formed a Red Cross mission to Russia. Now, Russia didn't want a Red Cross mission. And the Red Cross in Washington didn't want a mission going to Russia. But Thompson was a very influential gentleman. He financed it and organized it himself. The mission had nothing to do with either medicine or Red Cross. I listed the members of the mission. Out of 30, only six were doctors. The rest were Wall Street lawyers and financiers. There were representatives from Chase Bank, National City Bank, and the rest of it. The mission was a political vehicle to give assistance to the Bolshevik Revolution in November. What was the assistance? Well, very briefly, Colonel Thompson himself said, and it was in, published in the Washington Post, which is an authoritative source at the time, that he gave one million dollars to the Bolsheviks to help their revolution. That's Colonel Thompson, not me. There was intervention by American International Corporation, which was another vehicle based on Wall Street, in Washington, 
to forestall any possible assistance to the enemies of Bolshevism. Further, you can find in the British Foreign Office files the fact that Thompson and Lamont of the Morgans went to see Prime Minister Lloyd George in England and changed, in one meeting, British policy from being anti-Bolshevik to being pro-Bolshevik. This information, I would point out, comes from the British War Cabinet papers, Thompson's own papers, and the State Department files. The documents are quite genuine. Now, in early 1918, the Bolsheviks held only a very small part of Russia. They held, really, just Moscow and Petrograd. They were fighting both the whites and the greens. Now, the history books don't tell you about the greens. They only tell you about the reds and the whites. There were 700,000 greens. And the greens were Bolsheviks who saw that Lenin and Trotsky had betrayed the revolution to capitalists, and this was pointed out in the Russian newspapers at the time, and the Greens, 700,000 strong, were fighting against the Bolsheviks, with the whites. But what happened is that the Wall Street mission and its allies in, in the United States gave the Bolsheviks enough breathing space to be able to occupy Russia. Another point that fits in here is Guy Richard's latest book um, on the uh, rescue of the Romanovs, in which he I think proves that the Tsar was not killed, that there was, this is a myth perpetuated by Britain and the United States in collusion with the Soviet Union, for reasons which he will point out. And so this high-level collusion between the Soviet Union, the United States, and other countries has gone on since 1917. Now, also according to the history books, at the time of the revolution and the civil war in Russia, Russian industry was in ruins. This is nonsense. Russian industry was not destroyed except perhaps in Petrograd. It was idle. It was in what the Soviets call a state of technical preservation. What happened was that the middle class, the technicians and the managers, left Russia. They weren't Bolshevik. And the plants and the equipment were standing there idle. And the Bolshevik revolutionaries had no means to get it into action. What happened was, in the 1920s, the foreign companies, mainly American or German, and the German companies were affiliated with major American corporations, mostly, when th these companies went into Russia and they gave technical assistance or they took the foreign concessions, some three or four hundred of them, and this got the Soviet Union off in uh, economic development. This, of course, I've covered in the very first book I put out back, back in 1968, the period from 1917 to 1930, how very prominent firms like Westinghouse, General Electric, Ford Motor Company, Standard Oil, these firms, through concessions and technical assistance agreements, enabled the idle Russian industry to get restarted under the Soviets. There are two names which should not be forgotten from the 1920s. Evo Harriman, who was operating the Georgian manganese concession, and Armand Hammer, whose father, of course, Julius Hammer, was executive secretary of the Communist Party USA. That is something the Los Angeles Times never prints, but uh, it's quite verifiable. Um, so the Soviet Union, in that first decade, was enabled to survive and recuperate with the assistance of German and American firms, I would point out, to keep the, the uh, text straight, that the State Department was not at fault, as I see it. It's quite clear from the files, as, I've, uh, as I have read them, that State Department officials could look ahead. They saw the possibility of a war like Korea and Vietnam, or where the Soviets would supply the other side. They looked ahead, and they say, no, uh, stay out of the Soviet Union. Let it, uh, let it find its own feet, and we should not help to build it up. By 1928, the Soviet Union, with Western assistance, had restored a 1913 output. And the Soviet planners began to think about the five-year plans. Maybe a few of you will, will remember that back in 1930 in the United States, there was a great publicity about the great experiment in the Soviet Union, pulling up by the bootstraps, a model for Roosevelt's New Deal to copy. Uh, 
Our socialist society could do all kinds of wonderful things a free enterprise society could not do. Our free enterprise was outmoded. And who was saying this? Well, we find socialist Norman Thomas, and we find Roosevelt. But we also find, for example, a Gerard Swope, a president of General Electric Corporation, and we find Bernard Baruch. For those men that I call the corporate socialists, who run large corporations, then and now, I submit, are betraying a free enterprise society. Now, the Soviets certainly acquired a massive capacity in the first and second five-year plans. That's during the late 1920s and the whole decade of the 1930s. What has not been said historically is how they acquired this massive capacity. Simple common sense would tell you that a backward country just does not start to build modern steel mills and automobile plants. That's just common sense. The first five-year plan was almost entirely built by foreign corporations. General Electric, Ford, DuPont, Coppers, Badger, Foster Wheeler, Universal Oil, Douglas Aircraft, Radio Corporation of America, Pratt & Whitney, Hercules Powder, United Engineering, McClintock & Marshall, McDonald Engineering, McKee Corporation, you name it. Amongst the large U.S. construction corporations, they were there in Russia between 1928 and the beginning of 1933. The plants they built in the first five-year plan were far larger in capacity and far more technically advanced than they were building elsewhere in the world. And the second five-year plan in Russia, although this does not come out, of course, in the, in the official documents, was really bringing into production, into production the tremendous capacity built by these firms in the early 1930s. The first five-year plan itself was not laid out by Goss plan. The Goss plan, uh, plan was just not workable. The final technical plan that was utilized was actually drawn up by a firm of industrial architects, um, Albert Kahn of Detroit. United Engineering, to give you a few examples, built a plant in the Soviet Union in the early 1930s to produce the longest aluminum sheets in the world, and these, of course, are essential for aircraft manufacture. This was the time when all metal aircraft were just beginning, even in the West. General Electric built a Krakow a turbine plant which was two and a half times greater in capacity than its own plant in New York, which connected it. There were three gigantic tractor plants built in the Soviet Union, and the Soviets built more internationals and more caterpillars than those two companies built in the United States. Now, go back to my introduction, the three levels of information. The whole world largely still believes that the Soviets did it themselves. That's the official establishment version. In reality, the Soviets didn't do it. It was done by Western free enterprise. The cost, the cost in Russia were the millions of Russians who died in labor camps. I'd point out uh, Solzhenitsyn's arguments, Julius Epstein, Operation Kielhorn. Did the American firms know about this? Yes, they did. They lied in their public announcements when they said there was no forced labor in the Soviet Union. And they knew they were lying. I know they were lying because I've seen the reports in the State Department files. The engineers on site in Russia were protesting. It was the time of the Depression. They had to have a job. And the firms told them to do nothing, say nothing, keep quiet. And I submit that our larger corporations, the corporate socialists, were no more interested in Russians dying in the early 1930s than they were in Americans dying in Korea and Vietnam with technology that they had installed in the Soviet Union. And yet the way this world is put together, it's the Harrimans and the Hammers and the Morgans and the Rockefellers who are admired and lauded. And those who plead for human decency and state the facts of dictatorship are slandered and insulted. And we find, regrettably, academics fall over themselves to perpetuate the myth. So back in the early 1930s, Gerard Swope of General Electric and Bernard Baruch and their friends were building the five-year plans in Russia, but they weren't inactive elsewhere in the world. 
And this is one period where I've been able to develop most of the story. Roosevelt's New Deal, the NRA, National Recovery Administration, was not drawn up by the Grain Trust or Roosevelt's advisors. It was drawn up by a Gerard Swope of General Electric. And I've published the whole thing in the, the book I've just produced. I call it Swope's plan. It wasn't FDR's plan at all. And Herbert Hoover was quite correct when he called it fascism. Because Roosevelt's New Deal was nothing else but fascism along the lines of the Mussolini corporate state. And our friends, Bonner Baruch and General Electric, building up the Soviet Union, were also very active financing and promoting and writing for Roosevelt in the early 1930s. But also, they were active behind Hitler. It's interesting that both Hitler and Roosevelt came to power in early 1933. Now, the story of the promotion of Hitler by our own corporate socialists is yet unpublished. But I'll tell you this much. It'll give you the flavor of the book. I have the bank transfer slips, which is about the hardest kind of evidence you can get, of funds going from large corporations to the Nazi party, and particularly a political slush fund operated by Rudolf Hess. This was very important in the early 1930s when the Nazis needed all the money they could get to finance their, their gangs of goons going around the streets beating up people and the various payoffs and this kind of thing. One of these transfer slips refers to German General Electric, 60,000 Reichmarks. And two directors of German General Electric will interest you, or should interest you. One is Gerard Swope, General Electric, and the other is Owen Young, of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. So what we find is, when we begin to probe behind the scenes of history, is that we have these gentlemen promoting three brands of socialism all at the same time. They're building the first five-year plan in the Soviet Union, they're writing Roosevelt's New Deal for him, and they're trying to get Hitler into power in Germany, all at the same time. So let's go back to the building of the Soviet Union. During World War II, you will remember, there was the massive land lease program. This pretty much replaced any capacity the Soviet Union might have lost in World War II, but more importantly, it brought the Soviet Union to a fundamentally new technological horizon. I've covered the whole story of this build-up in uh, the, the Hoover series of books. By 1946, the Soviets had a capacity to do certain things themselves, but they could manufacture the shells of factories, that is the building, which is not too difficult, and they could duplicate simple equipment, simple lathes, this kind of thing. But they still needed, and still need today, foreign technology to advance the technological horizon for a quite simple reason, that a socialist planned society cannot advance technologically by itself. And once again, our Western businessmen were only too happy to oblige. And once again, they went into the Soviet Union in the 1950s, certainly the 1960s, and you'll see the, the peak of this in the last few years under Kissinger. And to give you again some examples from the development in these 20 years, you will find in mining equipment of firms like Joy Manufacturing, Non-ferrous metals, you'll find they're using, for example, the international nickel process for nickel smelting, refining. Iron and steel is an exception. Uh, the Soviets adopted the classical blast furnace back in the 1930s. Their plans were largely laid out by the Fine Corporation of Chicago. It's a very simple process. What they did was, up, was uh, build bigger units, what I call scaling up, and the... Uh, in classical blast furnace technology, they have not come back to the West, but they have done, in, particularly in rolling techniques, and the uh, what you might call the high technology forms of steel and metals. In petroleum processes, you can see the copying of the land-lease refineries all the way up to today, I think just a few weeks ago. There were recent agreements to transfer more pet petroleum technology to the Soviet Union. In chemicals, almond hammer, occidental petroleum, of course, has always played a key role. Textiles, we find Soviet nylon, um, all their synthetic uh, 
uh, fabrics are Western fabrics, but of course with different um, specific, uh, with different uh, model numbers, different categories. Motor vehicles, um, all the motor vehicle plants I can identify in the Soviet Union have equipment from the West. They have been able to reproduce simple transfer lines, but um, as you know, with the Karma plant, uh, still today, these Soviets require equipment from mainly from the United States. Soviet atomic energy, their first reactor was a copy of the Henford reactor, uh, but more importantly, they couldn't have achieved their atomic energy program without the United States help. I'm very skeptical today about the Rosenberg, the, the Rosenberg spy story. Um, what is much more important is how did the Soviets get the industrial technology, the equipment, the very specialized kind of equipment, which is needed for an atomic energy program. This could only come from one of three countries, United States, Switzerland, or Great Britain. Locomotives, for example, we find General Electric is the standard. In aircraft, we find all the Rolls-Royce engines powered the MiGs over Korea. The door, for example, on some of the aircraft is a Boeing door. You go right down the line, it's there. Merchant Marine, I calculated that exactly because the um, Soviets have published a very exhaustive catalog, a very big fat thing, of their Soviet ships. Every ship is there, catalog with its technical specification, and I can tell you exactly 67% of the hulls were built in the West. 80% um, of the engines were built in the West. The 20% that were not built in the West were built in the Soviet Union, mainly at Bryansk and in Leningrad, under technical assistance agreements. There's no such thing as a Soviet marine diesel engine. Uh, that's what got the Soviet Weekly upset in London and said I was wild. And of course, I pointed to their own uh, catalog and it's right there if they bother to get a, a calculating machine, which of course will have to be Western, and uh, they can um, they can repeat what I did. The computer technology is, is courtesy of IBM and Radio Corporation of America, but there's an English corporation, International Computers, which has transferred the most advanced of its own um, computer technology. I did happen to meet a director of this particular company uh, last April when I was in England, and I pointed this out to him, that uh, it was his own suicide. Uh, he had more to lose than England, and I pointed this out to him, that uh, it was his own suicide. Uh, he had more to lose than I had. And uh, his argument was that, well, the Americans do it, why shouldn't the British do it? And he was actually unable to see that it was his own suicide. But I did also meet a gentleman from the Dunlop Rubber Company, and Dunlop has been very important transferring rubber tire technology to the Soviet Union, who admitted that so far as that area is concerned, I was exactly correct. In fact, I hadn't got all of it. But um, he said, well, even if it is my own suicide, I will continue to do it because it's business. And I had no answer for that one. So what I'm saying is that in brief, all Western technology, uh, excuse me, all Soviet technology from 1917 right down to the present day comes from the West. And this is based on a very precise technical analysis. It's technical. I look at engines and machines and I look at specifications. It's not something I imagine. It's, I've been at this thing over a decade and a half and no one yet has proven me wrong on a technical factor. And this is approximately the position today, except that under Kissinger, the Soviets have been able to achieve a fundamentally new technological horizon, of course, with a financial subsidy, because they're, they're getting loans at 6% when you have to pay 10 and 12% with a financial subsidy from the United States. Now, the big problem that I had in the early 1970s was that this was not the whole story. There were at least two remaining problems. One, we were building up Soviet military capacity, capability, and there were indications, and I was a little unsure about this in 1970, that this was a deliberate policy on the part of the United States. I called it the X factor. I spotted it perhaps as early as the late 1960s that there was something operating there to enable these massive transfers to continue over a period of decades. 
And any time you pointed it out, you were immediately slapped down. There was some kind of behind-the-scenes pressure uh, making for these massive transfers. Now, the most important problem that I saw was the military transfer problem. So I'm sure some of you know I went to Miami Beach in 1972. I attempted to point this out to the Republican Party, and what I got was outright hostility. These are things we just don't talk about. Uh, looking at the Wall Street Journal last week and noting that Armand Hammer gave the Republicans $100,000 in 1972, I can see that I wasn't playing the right game. Um, I certainly give, didn't give them anything like $100,000. Now, to summarize the National Suicide Book, there is no question in my mind that Soviet military capability essentially depends on Western technology. But there is one exception I would point out, that you do not need a free enterprise system to develop military technology, because the military work in a rather different way to an industrialist. The military say, well, this is the next specification we want. They set up a specification and they work towards it and cost is no object. But within, of course, industry, cost is very much part of your objective. You've got to be competitive. And so what the Soviets have been very successful in doing is setting up a very adequate, a very sensible design, military design specifications, and using Western technology to work towards it and do it quite capably. So I'm quite sure the aircraft with our systems and their ships and their guns are, um, are quite effective. To give you some examples, um, American pilots were coming back in, in, during the Vietnam War and they were saying, well, that's funny because those trucks on the Ho Chi Minh Trail look like Ford trucks. Well, they were Ford trucks because half of them were coming from the Gorky plant, which was built by the Ford Motor Company. And you've got the MiGs over Korea, which I pointed out earlier, had Rolls-Royce engines, and Rolls-Royce and uh, some of the German designs, BMW, have been the basis of um, a Russian jet development. So that is approximately the story. What we need today is research to fill out the gaps in our knowledge of the loss of American independence. And there are two major areas which I suggest need study in depth. One is the Federal Reserve System particularly the political role of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York from 1913 up to today. Clearly, the Federal Reserve System controls money supply and therefore is a very important, if not a dominant factor, in what happens in the economy. This whole attempt to replace gold with artificial fiat money is part of this whole problem that I think has to be investigated. But up to the moment, we can't even get an audit of the Federal Reserve System. The second area which I think needs to be investigated is the Council on Foreign Relations. I don't have that much evidence myself, but a number of people I respect have, well, a great number of people I respect have pointed out that members of this particular council turn up in a number of key places on a very regular basis. I suspect that one can dismiss 90% of them as being academic hangers-on or social climbers, but there's a core in there which probably well warrants investigation. I can tell you this much. Certainly in the 1920s, where the State Department files are open, there is very clear evidence that members of the Council on Foreign Relations were fundamental. Um, in achieving a pro-Soviet policy and building up the Soviet Union. Gerard Swope, for example, was, uh, was most certainly a, a member. So given the state of our knowledge today, I think we can say the following. The constitutional independence of the United States has been abandoned. Further, there has been a knowledgeable and deliberate effort to build the Soviet Union into a formidable enemy, in spite of the fact of two wars in which 100,000 Americans and countless allies have been killed. I, sus I suspect, or I suggest, 
that there is a knowledgeable and deliberate effort to submerge U.S. independence into a web of economic and financial relationships with a totalitarian dictatorship. And this is in large part concealed from the American public. To go back to my earlier example, the truth is at the third level, and the statements coming out are all at the first level. On the other hand, these policies, as from where I stand, are not too well thought out in detail. Uh, there was a Foreign Affairs article in April 1974 entitled, I quote, The Hard Road to a New World Order. And it pointed out the problems with using the United Nations as a vehicle to achieve a socialist world state. And I suspect that the problems of creating a socialist world order are increasing and are somewhat greater than anticipated by the world planners. Some of the more important problems that I can glean from sources like foreign affairs would certainly be the United Nations. I suggest that the concept of United Nations as the global authority may have been abandoned and that the emphasis is going to be on regional planning, on regional management. The vehicles will be such things as world environment, commodities, food supply, population, that kind of thing. It's a more roundabout way to get the same objective. What I suggest uh, the process would be, would be to build larger pieces first and then weld these larger pieces together. We can observe a major effort to substitute SDRs, special drawing rights, paper money, for gold. These are going to be an engine of international inflation in the same way the Federal Reserve System has been an engine of domestic inflation. But historically, these attempts to use paper money have always collapsed. And I see no reason, technically, why the SDR effort should succeed. On the other hand, you cannot achieve a world order with hard gold currency because the politicians cannot print numbers on gold and they can print all the numbers they want on pieces of paper. So, as I see it, from, the, from my viewpoint, the world planners have got to impose a paper money system as part of their move towards what they call a new world order. The third problem, which may not sound, the third problem, which may not sound too much, but may in fact be the biggest stumbling block, is that, as I see society, the natural order of events is for people to group themselves together in small contiguous units, not in big regional groupings. People voluntarily associate in small groups, not in large groups. In other, uh, but on the other hand, the whole trend of a world order is towards unification and regional groupings. In other words, you're going in, in two different directions. The planners are trying to impose large regional units, but the natural trend order within society is towards small groupings. And I suspect that as more people begin to see what is happening, it's antagonistic to their own interests, that the resistance will also increase. So let me emphasize, and I'm getting near the end, one point. That the battle for American independence can only be won with facts, and they have to be accurate facts. I do not believe that the American people want to abandon the Constitution or free enterprise or individual freedom. I don't believe the American people want such things as internal passports, hundred billion dollar energy programs, forced busing, backbreaking taxation. I don't think they want it. Further, the establishment no longer has credibility. I've lost it because it's ignored too many facts, it's lied, it's distorted. And that is your opportunity to present the facts at the third level. But let me warn you, to retain a credibility, you've got to be 100% accurate 100% of the time. If you get it wrong once, you've lost your audience, 
Your enemies will never let you forget it. To make one mistake is instant loss of credibility. Sometimes it's very tempting, I think, to overstate the case, but don't do it, because you can't do it anyway. And let me leave you this morning with, I think, the moral of my story, what I tried to write over the last decade. We tend to emphasize the obvious. We can recognize the planners and their social friends. They're directly identifiable. To give you one example, Attorney General Levi says he's going to introduce internal passports and he knows it's unconstitutional. He says so. Now that to me is an obvious enemy. I don't sleep wondering what he's going to dream up for me next. But more important perhaps are those behind the scenes, what I call the subsidizers. Those who provide the technology, the financing, the political power, the political trust for world dictatorship. Look at the subsidizers. Look, for example, at big business. Big business supplied technology both to Hitler's Germany and to Soviet Russia, and back both at the same time, and Roosevelt for good measure. Look at the academics. who are more interested in promoting a new world order than in promoting freedom. And that's what they should be doing. Look at those organizations who promote anti-communism, but always stop short at identifying and pointing out those who subsidize and make possible the onset of a world of socialist state. So my moral today is, the moral I would like to leave with you, is that planners could not exist without subsidizers, and both are equally dangerous to what you hold to the truth. Thank you.